Okay, part two. And I'm making part two primarily because uh, YouTube is tweaked and it's not liking my videos and so well, perhaps you don't like my videos either. Uh, however, it tends to crash my system. So I find if I keep the videos shorter, even though they've given me a 15 minute extension on my videos, it still crashes my computer. So what follows is kind of a long and list of various kings of England and um, to understand the history of London it's kind of important to understand the kings and how political uh, situation uh, basically affected the situation. So uh, first we'll start with Ethelred the second. And Ethelred the second was uh, king of England from 978 to 1013. And then he returned to England from 1014 to 1016 to become king again. So uh, the important thing to know about Ethelred is that in 991 he was actually paying Danegeld or tribute to Denmark. And it's Ethelred's decision to kill Danish immigrants around the year 1000 that brings King Svein of Denmark to England with raiders and then later as an invasion force. So uh, Apparently, Sven's sister was a victim of the killings. So in 1013, Sven of Denmark, who is basically a Viking, uh, and who is also uh, father of Canute, who is later to become king of England as well, uh, came to England in 1013. And he defeated Ethelred, became king of England, and he actually he dies within a few weeks of taking over virtually all of England. It's at that point that things get a little sticky. So Svein dies, and his eldest son, Harold II, is crowned king of Denmark. But the Danish fleet in England uh, at that point had called Canute's name. Uh, Canute was another one of Svein's sons. And uh, at the same time, the English had called for Ethelred to return. So basically, we've got three possible kings of England. We've got Harold II, recognized as the king of Denmark. We've got Canute, who is in charge of this um, Danish uh, settlement invasion program that's going on here in England. And then we've got Ethelred, the former king who had been defeated by Spain. So Ethelred actually returns from exile in, of all places, Normandy, and he temporarily drives Canute out of England, uh, hence the 1014 to 1016 part of Ethelred II's kingship. So um, this brings us to Canute, who uh, ruled England from 1016 to 1035. And uh, in 1016, he returns uh, to England and now uh, Canute is king of Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Pomerania, Schleswig, no doubt after settling things with Harold II. Perhaps it's not Ethelred who drove Canute out at all, but rather Canute returning home to take care of business. One of the nasty things about history is how bias comes into play. So, for example, if you're reading an English history, I mean, who really cares about what transpired between Harold and Canute, right? Perhaps there's a Danish book that bears reading on that uh, uh, conflict between the two brothers or, or sons of the former King Svein. Uh, of interest is Canute actually did make a pilgrimage to Rome during his reign, but perhaps more on that at another time. So uh, Canute dies in 1035 and he leaves three heirs. And the last of the heirs being Hartha Canute. And it's this Hartha Canute whose mother is Emma, who's from Normandy. And uh, Hartha Canute is actually the last Danish king of England. So Hartha Canute in 1041 invites his half-brother, Edward the Confessor, back from exile in Normandy. Now the interesting thing here is that Edward the Confessor has the same mother as Hartha Canute. And this uh, brings up this uh, woman called Emma. So uh, Emma's son by Ethelred the Unready is Edward the Confessor. 
and Emma's son, Hartha Canute, is uh, Emma's son by another king. And uh, actually, I have kind of written here. Perhaps that'll explain a little better. So the Emma, the Nor Emma, the Norman, was in fact married to Ethelred and to Canute, both times as the second wife. The plot thickens, does it not? In fact, two of her sons from different fathers in Hartha Canute and Edward were kings of England, while two of her stepsons also became king. Uh, it's interesting to note that William the Conqueror was also Emma's great-grandnephew. Actually, Emma is in the city of London when Canute attacks, becoming widow to Ethelred and then agreeing to marry Canute, thus allowing her son Edward permission to leave for Normandy. So Emma's married to Ethelred and has her son Edward. Uh, Ethelred is then killed by Canute and Emma agrees to marry Canute and has a son, Hartha Canute. So, Hartha Canute in 1041 invites his half-brother to return to England from exile, and Edward the Confessor uh, becomes king of England after Hartha Canute dies in 1041. Uh, Edward the Confessor is king of England from 1042 to 1066, and he rules England with support of Godwin, who is a powerful English Saxon. Actually, he's an earl, a Saxon earl. And Edward's rule is weakened due to the presence of three powerful earls, and these men are Godwin, Leofric, uh, and Seward. Now the important part to remember here is that Godwin is a Saxon, Leofric is serving the former king, Ethelred, and Seward is, uh, we believe, a Dane. So in 1043, Edward marries Godwin's daughter. And in 1050, Edward has ecclesiastical troubles with the clergy, who had elected a new archbishop in Canterbury, uh, whom Edward rejected in favor of another man. So basically, this becomes a power play where Edward calls upon Leofric and Seward to support the king's position over that of Godwin. So Godwin is exiled, but later returns with an army and takes back his earldom when Seward and Leofric refuse to support the king. So in my opinion, it's this political back and forth game of power and authority that leads to London making greater claims of independence from the crown in return for financial support in the form of taxes. Uh, further complicating matters, Edward dies without any heirs. So King Edward's brother-in-law, Harold II, is crowned king, and he's challenged by Harold III of Norway as well as William the Norman Bastard. You can read up on the Battle of Fulford and later the Battle of Hastings in any pretty much any English textbook. Uh, so uh, effectively what happens here is Norman rule under William the Conqueror is a game changer. And it largely removes the native ruling class and replaces it with a foreign French-speaking monarchy, aristocracy, and clerical hierarchy. Note the earlier video on clerical corporatism. So this, in turn, brought about a transformation of the English language and culture of England. And you can see it in words like, for example, swine, which is a Saxon word, and pork, which is a French word. So uh, unlike Canute, who had paid for allegiance and service with gold, William, the Norman, uses the seized English lands and titles in return for service, which I mentioned in another video. So it's the Norman kings who build the ubiquitous stone castles of England in an effort to pacify the local people. It's William who increases local shire power over that of the earls, and in 1086 establishes the Doomsday, or Domesday, depending on how you want to pronounce it, as a chronicle of what was actually in the kingdom. Think of the Doomsday as a counting of things, which in turn leads to a taxing of things and a trading of lands for service. You can check it out. It's online. So of note is that it's the Normans who are in fact descendants of the Vikings, but perhaps that's a tale best left for another video. Uh, also, the interesting blending of English with Viking and Danish and French is also another interesting side story. But I guess I have to make a video about Vikings and the blending of English and uh, there's a lot of stuff. So, uh, you know, I've covered a lot of material in this video, but if you check the notes below, I'll write the guy's names and uh, the king's names and 
when they lived and uh, perhaps it'll be enough to cover most of what's going on here. But effectively this changing back and forth of kings leads to a greater independence of London, in my opinion.